All right, we're recording. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Adam Miller. I am the newest uh, member of the Fedora Release Engineering team. I currently work on Fedora Engineering. Before that, I spent three years working on OpenShift Online. Uh, for anybody who's familiar with OpenShift, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but today we're talking about next generation tooling in uh, Fedora Release Engineering, and that's a half lie. Uh, because it is true that we're going to talk about that, but before we talk about that, we're actually going to talk about some background topics, and some of them are going to be kind of fundamental uh, to understanding um, what we are today, what we were yesterday as a project as a distribution, and what we're going towards tomorrow, and then what that means to release engineering in terms of things that we need to cater to, goals that we have, tooling that we need to either uh, alter, refactor, or come up with completely new uh, in order to deliver those things. Um, so background, so we're going to start off with what is, uh, we're going to define release engineering, we're going to define uh, what an operating system is, and that seems very kind of ground layer, like but just base level, but when we add to that defining what an application is and discussing the separation or possible separation of those things, <coughs> it, gets, it gets interesting. And then what is a package, what is a distribution, and how these things correlate to both Fedora as a project uh, as well as to release engineering. From there, uh, we're going to talk briefly about Fedora Rings and where we're going with that from a release engineering standpoint, from a uh, compose and build tooling uh, perspective, uh, what we have in place today, what we're going to work towards tomorrow. Um, and I see Ralph uh, in the audience, and I realized I forgot something in one of my slides that we were talking about uh, for release tooling. I'm going to mention it, and I'll add it later. Uh, so background. Uh, to kick it off, what is release engineering? And I shamelessly stole a nice formal definition for Wikipedia. Uh, so it is a sub-discipline uh, sub of software uh, engineering concerned with compilation, assembly, and delivery of source code um, to create products and so other software components. And the goal for Fedora anyways, and, and I put in there that surely I just, because I do, and this is, uh, there's two URLs here, and because of the contrast, it's kind of uh, difficult to see. But I believe the slides will end up on the internet at some point, hopefully. Uh, you can click them and read them. And, and there is the overview of what Fedora Release Engineering is um, in, in more detailed context and what that means in definition and uh, roles and responsibilities. Uh, and then as well, uh, the Fedora Release Engineering philosophy. And that breaks down uh, basically what these two lines come up with, is maintain sanity in the pipeline going from upstream source code into something that is consumable by the Fedora community and the user base. Um, and produce and maintain tools that facilitate in that goal. Uh, so in, in a nutshell, that, that is kind of what our, our aim in life is to be and what we want to deliver to the community and, and to the project. <coughs> and it, it rolls around this whole concept of build sanity and build reproducibility and other attributes of that. So before we talk about the tooling and what it means to release engineering these different concepts, I want to kind of ask a few questions and define a few things. So what is an operating system? <clears throat> operating system is software that manages your computer hardware and software resources, provides common services, computer programs, also shamelessly stolen from Wikipedia. Uh, and so at a fundamental standpoint, this is what allows us to interact with our hardware. It provides the, the core components that we need to do everything else. And what is everything else? Well, generally everything else is considered an application, at least in current standards of definition and, and nomenclature and common, um, I guess, paradigms of, of thought process around what a computer experience is, not just you know, the operating system, but everything. Um, and that you know, kind of branches and, and bridges from what we do with like servers and big iron uh, mainframes down to what we do on tablets and cell phones. It's, 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 what does that mean? What does it mean to be an operating system? So that kind of brings us to the next one. What is an application? An application is a set of computer programs designed to permit, again, I stole this from Wikipedia. I'm just shamelessly like, <laughs> I, I have my credit lines and I'm happy with that. Uh, so designed to permit <coughs> the user to perform a group of coordinated functions, tasks, or activities. Application software cannot run on itself, but is dependent on software execution. And what I love the most, and I, I felt like it needs to be said again, it is dependent on the system software to execute. So it's dependent on the operating system. And that raises the question that uh, I first heard from Alex Larson. I don't know where it originated entirely, um, but I heard it from him in a talk he gave, and I thought it was fantastic. And I like to bring this topic up again because it's something I think about a lot, um, probably to an unhealthy extent, um, just like I think about um, 
uh, self-hosted versus non-self-hosted operating systems and programming languages, and these are things that keep me up at night because I uh, am different. Uh, and that's okay, and I'm okay with that, and it's healthy or not healthy. Um, but one of my favorite taglines, because I'm a packager, and I came into Fedora as a community packager, and I love packaging, and, and that's very weird, and I get extremely passionate about packaging software systems um, in, in different language you know, frameworks, so you know, like in Python and Ruby and NPS, like Node.js, and this like kind of kludge that is kind of Go packaging, that, anyways. Um, what's a package? <clears throat> what is a package? If we have an operating system, we have an application, and there might be some definition of where one and the other stops, what is the package? Well, the package is, is effectively a build artifact from source code that, be, that can be consumed, and that can vary in terms of what it is based on content versus code, because if it's content, it's like icons or wallpapers or documentation. But if it's code, then it becomes an application, but it could be part of the operating system, because the base OS is built out of packages, but everything else is as well. So when you get into the world of packaging systems, um, at least as a distribution is built, and we're, the next slide is what's a distro, uh, in, in a distribution is you have a package format. So for Fedora, it's RPM. For RHEL, it's RPM. For Sandbox, it's RPM. That is the thing that we centralize on. It's the common component, and it's very powerful in nature, and there, I don't see any reason necessarily to get rid of it or, or try to uh, change what it, it does at its you know, functional level at the, at the ground zero, but um, what about things that aren't RPMs? What about things that people in the community actively use that are flourishing on their own? Things like um, Python pip and Ruby gems and Node.js NPM and Maven and others that I probably am not very familiar with. Uh, uh, I know like CPAN is still a thing. Um, you know, there's Peckle and Pear and like all of these different, you know, systems out there that very large groups of people uh, in, in very vibrant communities in their own right, in their own piece of the technology world are very interested and enthusiastic about, um, almost to the point that I'm enthusiastic about RPM. Probably not as much. Um, I, I get a little um, animated in my excitement and that's, that's, that's good, but where, you know, where kind of in the stack do we differentiate how much of that really needs to be brought into things in, um, in, in a Fedora context? Uh, actually, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but in a Fedora context, um, we kind of roll towards the, like, what's a distro? So a distribution, a Linux distribution, is an operating system made as software collection based on Linux kernel and often on a package manager system, and this rolls back to that. So from Fedora, what does this mean today versus what it meant yesterday? So yesterday, um, the distribution was a one-stop shop. I mean, when, when, the, when SourceForge reigned supreme, nobody who ran a package, a, a, an operating system or a distro based on a package management system would just randomly grab things and compile it. Like, nobody ran that in production. That's not the way we did business. That's not the way that anybody, like, who really had a, a good set of standard practices in place did things. However, what we're starting to see in this kind of shift, people are running things from NPM in production, people are running things from Ruby gem in production. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? I think is up to the merit of the people doing the work to debate and that's fine whether or not they do believe or don't believe, but then you add, add containers and you have these Docker environments and you have uh, Rocket and you have Run C and you have, you have all these different things that allow you to kind of put a contextualized sandbox around this environment that may or may not be what you traditionally thought it was. Um, so a long time ago, the Yum repository was the place to be. That's where software came from. That's where you got your software, period, DM, full stop. And that's kind of changing. We're seeing, we're seeing a fundamental uh, you know, branch out in, in you know, avenues to, to consume software. Um, so <clears throat> it used to be this one-stop shop, and it's no longer. It's moving into this thing where people aren't doing that as much. Um, one of my actually, one of my favorite examples of this um, has, it actually isn't Fedora, uh, but uh, Jessie Frazzle, uh, she's a Docker core contributor, and she's also a Debian uh, maintainer, um, but she's notorious around the internet for giving these talks about running just wildly interesting things in Docker containers, and like one of the most recent things she did was like ran Quake 4 or something, 
um, in a Docker container on her laptop on stage at a conference, um, just kind of showing everything. And she has this GitHub account where she's got like something in the ballpark of like 40 different applications that are just standard desktop applications, um, things that she uses as a day-to-day -day basis. And she runs like her entire desktop in a set of Docker containers. And like everything is aliased and things so that when she runs it, her, um, so tiling window manager, I use i3. Um, she's also an i3 Ooh. user, but yeah. Uh, so there's a there's a, a system launcher called uh, um, D menu. So if she runs a thing in D menu, it'll actually map to a Docker container. It's very interesting to see this. Di you know that's completely different software delivery mechanism. Pulling directly from the Docker Hub through your registry, and you that's where you get software from. Um, and if you read the her Docker files, it's not actually coming from a distro package. Like they're all built from source on inside of that container, and then like pulled down. I don't know if they all are. The few that I looked at were, and it was just I thought it was fun and interesting. But just that, that's a, a, an, an example of where th this is wildly different from how it used to be done. Like that, if you, if you propose that to, I think, a room of system administrators or a room of traditional Linux distro users five years ago, they would have laughed or thought you were crazy. Um, but that's not that far-fetched anymore. Like it's just not, like it's just because of how things have progressed and changed. And um, I think a lot of these different um, avenues for consuming content or consuming code or programs have matured as time has gone on. It's not as Wild West crazy idea to do. So, uh, thinking about Fedora, <clears throat> uh, where did the operating system and the application begin? I got a little bit ahead of myself on this slide because I just really like that particular question. And I think that's a, 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 it's an arbitrary concept, but it's one that you have to define. And I think it needs definition at some point because the reality is, is there is a difference. And I think good examples of this are generally mobile operating systems. Um, Android, iOS, Firefox OS, Chrome OS. They have a very firm definition of where the operating system stops and the application begins, such that you can, you can completely upgrade and, and maintain each one independent of one another in completely separate life cycles. Um, so for an, a, uh, an Android application, as an example, um, so I, I am a Cyanogemon user. It's a community distro of uh, Android. I'm a big fanboy of all things community and open source and things like that. And there are community open source rebuild of AOSPs, a lot of things. Uh, but anyways, I run the nightly builds uh, because I'm crazy. I also periodically run raw on my laptop. Um, they, they put out these nightly builds and I can upgrade my operating system underneath my applications every day of the week. And my, op my applications don't need to change. Nothing about them changes. Um, the cache gets erased and it redoes a, 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 the Arch VM caching optimizations when it reboots. But you can maintain these things separate in, in separate life cycles and, and those kind of things. And if you take that concept into you know a more, I guess, large scale operating system, if for lack of a better vocabulary term, how do you take that concept? down there, well, it's containers. I mean, it's already being done right now, like you have containers. Um, I think a prime example of that is, uh, in, is RHEL 7 with certified RHEL 6 containers. You now have applications that ran on an older operating system that you can now run at a different life cycle than the OS is actually touching the bare metal. And that's very, it's, I think it's a fascinating thing in the whole concept of what we're able to do with that moving forward. Um, what we can do in Fedora, I think, is, is very special there. Uh, I think, going back to my comment about Rawhide, I, I love the idea of Rawhide. I want the hottest bits at all times. I want them on my laptop yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But right now, if I do a DNF update and I pull in 130 packages, this is actually something that happened to me. I pulled in 140 some odd packages, something broke. And I started going to Koji because we don't keep, you can't do downgrades. You won't keep history. It's just raw height, the latest for the poll, for the compose. Um, so I go to Koji and I grab packages one by one and I downgrade them. And about 30 packages in, I didn't find what had broken it. And I just gave up and I reinstalled my laptop to the current stable version of Fedora at the time. And I just kept moving on with my life. Um, but if we did an OS versus application split, and the OS was, I don't know, a, an atomic image? and I were to just switch, do an atomic host downgrade, and I switch to yesterday's tree, and I reboot. All my application space is still there. It's, it has not modified, but my OS is different. 
It's, it, we have a lot of advantages there. We can make raw hide a more attractive option for developers and contributors within the community who want to work on the late breaking, most cutting edge technology um, with that you know, kind of safety blanket of easy rollback and not modifying or, or altering an application space. Yes? Why can't we just use an old version of all the packages and then download the source? Well, because, <clears throat> so that's actually an interesting question. Let's say, for example, there's a, a post, a post install or a post uninstall or a trigger in the RPM transaction to where some artifact is left behind when I do an upgrade or a downgrade and now the functionality of something has changed. And that doesn't happen often, but it has happened. Um, it, whereas with an, with, an o, with an RPM OS tree, it is a, literally a full tree. It's effectively like a git snapshot of a file system with this set of packages. So you have almost a guarantee that the tree that worked for you yesterday is going to work for you today because it is unmodified. Um, whereas with your file system, if you did a young or a DNF upgrade and then a DNF downgrade, you still have modifications on the system, like state changed. I, I can speak to that. Go ahead. I've worked for a company that did RPM rollback for a long time. Basically, they did most of the upgrades. Um, oh, And I don't disagree with that, and, and I think that's a good point, um, is, is a lot of functionality like that does work in RHEL, and I think it's because of um, probably the engineering effort and the extra QA effort that goes into those things and, and the support team behind it. However, in Fedora space, I'm thinking more about the cutting edge, the rawhide. Like in rawhide nightly builds, we test zero of that, and we have zero guarantee that those kinds of things work. Um, and there could even be a bug that was introduced that would break some of that functionality. And that's, and that's kind of more of what I'm getting towards because in release engineering standpoint, we're always looking towards the next release. We're looking towards maintaining the current one, getting updates out the door, but also the next release, the deliverables for that. And so from, from the release engineering perspective, I'm thinking more of those concerns as opposed to long-term maintaining a running system um, that may need to live around uh, for extended life cycle. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be 100% thing. I'm yes. just like, it would solve one problem if you have to accept like 99% of the right. way. Like, 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 Um, so I, I don't disagree with you, but I also I, I want to kind of move um, because what I'm I'm getting towards is part of what the like Fedora as a project wants to do. Um, so just very quickly, if these things weren't tightly coupled, um, right now today we have Docket, uh, Docker Rocket um, XGF. If anybody's not familiar with XGF, it's this kind of very interesting concept about running um, containerized desktop applications inside of um, effectively a container sandbox such that it is shipped holistically as an OS tree. And so then they go on a run out of this, 
I was actually just about to mention that there's a fault like the right after this it couldn't have been more conveniently timed there's a talk on that and everybody should go uh, I'm, I'm actually I will be there I'm very excited to uh, to see because I, I very cursor like on a cursory concept know what it is but I, I've seen it I've only seen it work in like a demo on the internet and I'm very excited to see it work anyways so throw our rings so this kind of brings around to like the, the sort of next concept that's been kind of mulling and manifesting and coming to light uh, in more recent time. And so if we were to think about it, like the base design would be our, our operating system. And then everything out here could be our application space. And, and that's, that's very interesting from a release engineering standpoint because what we need to build and how we build it might change dramatically. Because right now it's all, it's just one big clump sum. It's, it's a giant package set. It's a giant repository. It's a giant composition of things where we generate metadata and have tracking for what needs to go into ISO images for the different products and those kinds of things. So, Fedora rings, question mark. What does that mean to release engineering? So we need to be able to adapt more rapidly. And this is a big thing is because we have this, we, we have, we just, we have, build artifacts and our, our purpose is to deliver them as quickly as possible to cater to the needs of the community, to cater to the needs of the contributors. However, we need to maintain sanity within that. We can't allow things to become the Wild West. Um, I think a great example of this that kind of has enabled um, a lot of people to do a lot of things more rapidly is Coper. Coper has allowed people to build um, anything and they can do it as rapidly as they would like to on any release of Fedora without breaking the bulk user base. And that's great. I think I'm a big fan of that. Um, it, it caters to that need without breaking the core deliverable from a release engineering standpoint that defines the product of Fedora Workstation or the product of Fedora Server or the product of Fedora Cloud. It lets these things iterate independently and people can optionally install it on top. So it has, it has its own independent life cycle. I understand like its delivery mechanism is still very similar to the traditional setup that we have, um, but it can optionally override components that are within the core, you know, the core environment. So in terms of what, are, what is actually delivered, um, we need to maintain this kind of concept or this set of, of fa facilitated sanity and, and stick with the, the release engineering criteria. Things need to be reproducible, audible, definable, and deliverable. Um, and, and what that means to different people is varying. The link that I mentioned earlier has formal definitions of what we mean by that. But basically, reproducibility is we need to have, and if anybody uh, attended the reproducible build talk um, yesterday, anyone? Okay. It was an amazing talk. We missed a, a, a good one. Uh, but it, it discussed a lot of what this means to us and such that if you have the same build environment, the same um, build repository, the same set of point in time snapshot of all the packages, with the same inputs, you will get the same outputs. Uh, it's not like a byte for byte thing because if you do checksums on like modify, like M time and A time and this or that, but you would end up with the same output. Um, we need auditable build tooling in such that we can trace it for security auditing, um, CVEs, that kind of thing. Uh, there's some interesting things going on right now in Docker space where like Docker images are just kind of like this black box. Like you, you may or may not know how builds are created and what's in it. Uh, you can unpack your tarball and stare at binaries all day, but then it's difficult to audit. Uh, there's people working on it. There's actually an auditing toolbox that's being worked out. It's on GitHub. Uh, I'm looking forward to that, <coughs> which I'll actually mention in a minute and something that we're working on. So, uh, build tooling today uh, and yesterday. So we have Koji, and Koji in its, or in its original format was RPM centric. It was built in a time where the RPMs was the delivery mechanism. It was built in a time where the distro was a one-stop shop, and it catered that very well. Um, somewhere along the way, image factory integration was added. It allows the churning of, of things like cloud images, and, um, and then we also have the live CD creator, which I understand is being replaced at some point. Uh, I'm not, I, I, I'll be very, uh, I'm, I'll admit, I don't know what's going on with live CD creator. Um, Pungy, <coughs> so Pungy is a compose tool, um, and that's, 
that's been around for a while. It's currently iterating, being rewritten, and adding new functionality. Uh, Lorax, Lorax does uh, tree compositions. Um, Bodhi is the uh, update mechanism that everybody knows and loves. And then uh, the Wild West is Copper. So tooling for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, arbitrary tomorrow, Code 2.0. So Code 2.0 um, will be content generator centric, and if anybody went to the Code 2.0 talk yesterday, we have a lot of more insight on this. But effectively, a content generator is um, a build mechanism or build um, system or tool that will take a set of inputs and provide a set of outputs based on a standard definition of what metadata is required to um, define and create those things. And that metadata and the, the build artifacts can be passed within those systems. And RPM builds would then be a first class content generator, and there could be other things. Now, the content generator is going to be specific to Code 2. Uh, we're supposed to be having that in Code 1 to 11. But in 2, it will be kind of a first class data type, for lack of a better term. And, and that will allow us, from a release engineering standpoint, to pivot more rapidly on these newer types of built artifacts that need to be generated and produced uh, based on community demand. Uh, so I think one of the big things that I, I will admit that we're like behind on right now is Docker. Uh, I, think, I think Docker has exploded and it's very popular. And from a Fedora tooling standpoint, um, in terms of what we as a project officially release, there are certain things that I think um, we're a little bit behind the curve on, um, and that might be, that might actually not be fair. From a distro standpoint, I don't even know if anybody else is doing it at all. Uh, what we're working on, so maybe we're ahead of the curve. Uh, but I, I like to think that we we are we you know feature friends first. We we try to try to rule. But anyways, so one of the things that you know we could we could add is whatever the next. Docker is, you know, if it's not containers, it, you know, it could be some other piece of technology that gets really hot in five years and it's just exploded overnight and the whole world's excited about it. And it's very revolutionary and, and you know, kind of um, changing in the way that we traditionally do things or paradigm shifting, that kind of thing. And we should be able to adapt to that better. And I think um, having something that is uh, centered around this concept of the content generator, we could then have a system that would integrate very, um, tightly but be loosely coupled in the sense that it doesn't have to be integrated into the Koji code base to function as though it was. Um, and that, that's going um, to lend itself to us in a big way. Um, so Punji 4, it's currently in use. Uh, it's constantly being iterated on. That actually took composed time, I think, from something like 12 hours down to 4 hours. Like it was a huge performance uh, increase. It, it allows a lot of different build and compose uh, tasks to be farmed out through Koji, um, sort of things that should have been able to be run in parallel but weren't able to based on um, Punji 3, like design something or other. They've been resolved or refactored or re, you know, reinvented in such a way that you know parallel tasks can be executed in parallel and it just sped things up a lot for the composes, which is going to lend itself to allowing Rawhide to look, so Rawhide nightly builds are gonna look more like a traditional um, release, so when there's a test candidate or a beta or alpha beta build or a release such that you have all of the everything artifacts, the ISOs, um, those kinds of things, the raw high nightlies are going to look identical to that. Um, and that will hopefully lend itself to uh, more easily integration with QA processes because all, all of the composed outputs from uh, the release engineering standpoint will be identical so we're not messing with different um, batches of, of build artifacts put out. Um, so layered image builds for containers. This is what I was kind of alluding to a little bit uh, that I thought we could could have done better on, but then when I think about it, I don't think anybody else is really doing it. Anyways, so maybe we're ahead. Um, in Docker, there's this concept of a layered image. Uh, you can have your base image just be a core set of 100 packages. Then let's say your next layer will have Python. And then, well, no. I don't mean for because you know your next layer has I don't know what's cool this week Node Node.js. Um, on top of that, you have Grunt. That's the, yeah, Grunt's a thing. People like Grunt. Grunt, and then insert thing here, and then your application on top. So you have multiple layers underneath. Let's say layer two has a security exploit. Let's say, for example, the build system has forty of these that share layer two. 
how do you audit them? Well, the concept of the layer build image, uh, the layered image build service will allow, number one, the Docker files to be integrated into Diskit. Number two, the builds to be executed through Koji through the Fed package, uh, a Fed PKG client. And then number three, these automated rebuilds of things based on audited uh, notifications for CVEs um, so that people who use and consume applications and containers that are layered images out of the Fedora project uh, can have confidence in the fact that they're, they're maintained at a certain amount of reliability and a certain level of quality, um, much like the distribution itself. So it, it's kind of a new type of deliverable from Fedora. Is that being worked on yet? It's being worked on right now. Uh, it is being worked on right now. Um, I actually really wanted to have a demo for everybody today. Um, but I found a bug in um, a thing. Uh, I've, I've done <laughs> is this the OSBS stuff? It's OSBS stuff, yes. Yeah, so um, I, I have a slide on it, a couple in like two slides. Uh, but it's uh, OSBS, it's the OpenShift build ser uh, system, OpenShift build service, OpenShift build service. Um, so OpenShift build service client, actually, so OpenShift version three, um, based on, on top of Kubernetes, adds a lot of uh, abstraction for things like builds, build integration, source image building, um, and dev tooling and, and entire lifecycle chain. Um, the entry point into the OpenShift dev, uh, OpenShift build tooling has a, a profile for a custom builder. Um, the OpenShift build service client tools call into that API entry point and use a custom builder to afford us all of these features of, of the more robust build tooling. Um, so, that's something that's kind of being worked on right now. Uh, we're aiming to have uh, something available in staging in the next few weeks, uh, and so, so that we can kind of announce it, let people start kicking the tires on it. Um, more details fall on that. There is, we have, the team that's working on it, we have a, a public Kanban board, um, but it's in a system called Taiga that may or may not be long for this world. We're discussing, uh, we actually will probably tomorrow as a group get together and discuss uh, a handful of tools and try to decide on something for project, project management type things within the Fedora community, um, and that's probably gonna end up being a very long-winded discussion, but anybody who's interested in project management style things uh, in the Fedora space, uh, we should organize and get a group together and, and talk about that. Um, so I know the QA team is using Fabricator, we're using Taiga, um, we need to, I would like to, just as like a quick little tangent, I would like to try and find a project management style uh, tool set to standardize on a, as a Fedora community, such that there's like an entry point for new contributors coming in who want to look at what's going on all over the place and you could just be like, oh, I'm curious what's going on here. That'd be great. And integrate it into Fedora Hub. Did everybody see the Fedora Hub stock? Yeah? One? It's going to be amazing. I'm so, like, I'm so stoked. Who like, okay, who has an Android device? Okay, who uses Google now? With cards, like the little swipe thing? Imagine that but better in web format and widgets and things that pop up based on like, yeah, in for Fedora, all things Fedora. It's, you should have gotten the stock. <laughs> all right, uh, Fedora Atomic, two week releases. Another big thing that we're working on right now is Fedora Atomic. Uh, the Project Atomic group is pushing the envelope. They're doing a lot of iteration. They do two weeks uh, release, uh, or two week uh, cuts for upstream components they work on. Um, they worked with us and actually requested that we start churning out two week releases on that. So for uh, Fedora 23 and beyond, hopefully we get it in for Fedora 23 final. Um, the plan is to actually have that be a new lifecycle deliverable within the Fedora space. And that kind of starts, that's gonna be, in, I think the first thing that we start delivering outside of the general six month cycle um, to start trying to like start paving the way to allowing different components or different products within the Fedora space. So workstation and server and cloud could later maybe pick their own lifecycle um, it, within Fedora and actually set up release tooling to allow that. Uh, the Wild West is gonna be Coper. Doper is actually Coper, but for Docker, um, which is already out there in staging, it's being worked on. It's, 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 very, it's very good uh, uh, tech, you should go check it out. Um, other, so the other is just we don't know. Like, we don't know what's gonna come next. What's gonna be the new interesting thing that everybody wants to um, check out and do. I'm, I just realized like, I'm standing in the way of the slide deck and the camera thing. Hi everybody, sorry. Um, so we don't know what everybody's gonna wanna work on next. We don't know what's gonna come out in the next few years. Uh, but we want to try to cater to that and be as quick to pivot as possible. So, really quick, Atomic two weeks. 
we actually have a plan. Like there's a plan to like like test it, automate things, and get it out the door. So <coughs> effectively, um, so we will trigger um, an OS3 kickoff build based on detecting a change in a, a artifact that goes into that. Right now, today, that's just a set of RPM. So there's an update to an RPM that lands in OS3. Um, Koji should, right now Bodhi does, but based on a fed message, it will kick off a build. And then when that build happens, it will automatically kick off a test, and that test will be marked pass or fail. Um, if it fails, it will go down to um, a bug filer, or yeah, bug filer. If it uh, passes, it can be marked as a release candidate. Um, once it passes the set of tests, and the tests are not yet up on Pagur. Everybody familiar with Pagur.io? P-A-G-U-R-E dot I-O. It's an open source GitHub clone. You can sign with your fast account. It's good stuff. There's gonna be a lightning talk on it today. You should go. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, Pierre um, uh, Pingu on IRC, uh, he wrote it. It's good stuff. We've been using it. it. It has existed for like a month, so if you don't know about it, it's not like a huge, like you missed the boat. Um, it's very, very new, but we've been using it in release engineering uh, for our stuff, and it's, it's been very good for our workflow. Um, but anyways, we're going to host the, um, the atomic test up there that will run in Tunir. Um, so I went to Kushal's Tunir talk earlier today. Yeah, I won. All right. Turn on. All right. No, um, it's, it's a very simple um, testing framework. Uh, the language for it is, is based on the premise of um, exit codes of commands. So you can use any test suite, unit testing, whatever. Uh, Cucumber, anything. If the test runs and fails, then it that step in the test fails. Um, there's things to modify. You know, non-zero is not a failure, etc. Um, but it's very simple. It's uh, so we're at, at first pass. The test is going to run through um, Then it will become a release candidate. And then at the point of release, the um, the the latest release candidate. Will go in. It will be uplo uploaded to cloud providers. It will be uploaded to F FTP. There will be an auto automated kickoff to update the uh, website um, that does not yet exist, but we're working on it. It's out on the wiki if you want to check out the status of that. Um, and then update links, send out an email to announce, and maybe roll back if we break something. Uh, and then our we'll have quick doc once it's download, uh, launch instructions, those kinds of things. So this is the base idea and. Um, a, a very shameless uh, rip off of this. I stole this diagram from Matt Miller. I, I want to thank him uh, exponentially for writing this up because it's it's amazing. The, this is the plan in visual form, uh, and I'm bad at diagramming. So uh, this is my diagram handiwork. <laughs> <laughs> this is why they don't let me diagram things. Um, so this is the layer image build system, uh, kind of at an overlay overview. So we have some of our disk kits. We have a fed package. Um, this kit is where the Docker files will live, and fed package is where you will set your commands off, much like you do RPM builds of today. Um, the build we'll call will go out to Koji. Koji is linked into the OpenShift environment via the OSBS tooling. Um, the OSBS tooling will actually do the build inside of our uh, OpenShift environment, and then um, we'll uh, export all of the build artifacts and store them in uh, Koji, and then we can also auto-upload them to a Docker registry of our choice. Whether or not we host them ourselves or externally, that has yet to be decided. Um, but that is uh, on the roadmap. So this is the layered build uh, kind of visualized versus me just hand waving and blabbing about it. So what next? Um, so containers. Supporting alternate container formats is something that we've had requests for and is kind of on the roadmap for some indeterminate amount of time in the future. But it is something that we're, we're looking into. So Rocket Run C is new in the Open Container Foundation, or whatever. Are they renamed themselves again, I think? I don't know. Uh, so Run C, and then Freight Agent. If anybody's not familiar with Freight Agent, it's a, it's a new, uh, it, well, it's not only really new, it's a new delivery mechanism for container uh, root file systems that has systemd and spawn on the back end, and it like, is all kicked off with systemd unit files and stuff. Um, and then other. But we do, I mean, what's the next big thing? We don't know. I mean, there's there's new container technology popping up all the time. Um, Atomic Workstation, uh, the Atomic Workstation proposal that hit the mailing list recently, the desktop mailing list, um, which I don't know. Somebody in the working group wrote that. Um, at some point, <laughs> so at some point, we're going to have to uh, figure out what that's going to look like and how we need to build that, how we need to deliver that from a release engineering standpoint. So that's something that we're kind of trying to pay attention to as it develops and as it progresses over time. 
Um, I, for one, am like really excited about it because I I've almost just built my package set as um, an OS as a atomic image, anyways. Because I, I already have um, Ansible playlists on my laptop. So I'm weird. Um, so Neural Fuel app for anybody who's not familiar, um, Neural Fuel is an app is a container application specification such that you can link together multiple containers to comprise an application um, such that you don't have multiple services running in a single container. Each service would exist on its own. It provides metadata for linking it, that kind of thing. Um, the build system, so the layered image build system will at a later date support this and allow uh, people to actually uh, pipe in neural fuel application builds into the, into the environment and then um, pop out the containers and people can pull the spec and it'll, if we do it right, it'll work. Um, and then the next new hotness, we just, we don't know, but these are kind of the things in our general, uh, you know, future unknown uh, timeline roadmap that we want to work on from a release engineering standpoint in the next generation tooling um, on top of and to the side of currently continuing to maintain everything that is uh, Fedora today. Questions? That's either really good or really bad. <laughs> Thank you all.